Access lists and packet filtering. On Cisco routers and switches, within the Internetwork Operating System command line interface, an access list is a collection of rules and traffic conditions that can be used to filter both incoming and outgoing traffic on an interface where that access list is applied. In this respect, you can compare it to the firewall functionality of IP tables and IP chains in a Linux environment. Router access lists conform to four basic types standard, extended, distribution, and named. In addition to these, MAC access lists can be applied to port interfaces on Cisco switches. The access list packet filtering process. When a packet is evaluated by an access list, it goes through several stages. First, it is compared with each rule of the access list sequentially. Beginning with the first rule in the list, each subsequent rule evaluates the packet until one is reached that matches the conditions of that packet. Once a rule is found whose conditions match the details of the packet, that rule's action is executed. Even if there are other rules in the list, they are never accessed. The catch-all rule. If a packet's characteristics do not match any of the rules in an access list, that packet will automatically be dropped. This follows a better safe than sorry philosophy. To ensure that packets that do not match the rules in a particular access list are allowed through an interface, you must always add a catch-all rule to the end of every access list with permit any. This philosophy and syntax is also followed with Linux's IP tables and IP chains and many Active Directory firewall configurations. Typically, a catch-all rule specifies that any traffic not matching any previously defined rules is permitted through an interface. Failure to specify a catch-all at the end of each access list effectively disables that interface for any traffic not matching any of the list previously defined rules. This effectively means that there is an invisible implicit deny all at the bottom of every access list, dropping all unmatched packets. This rule must be overridden to allow other traffic to pass through. Incoming versus outgoing. Any of these types of access lists can be applied to both incoming and outgoing traffic. While the syntax is subtle, the effects are dramatic depending on whether you specify in or out on access lists. These options determine the direction of the traffic the access list applies to. Access lists can be divided into four basic categories, standard, extended, distribute, and named. When an inbound access list is applied to an interface, any packets that are denied are dropped and aren't routed through any other interfaces. In addition, no forwarding or routing decisions are made and this saves router resources. When an outbound access list is applied to an interface, packets are routed first and then filtered before they leave the chosen interface on the router. These packets are neither denied nor dropped until just before they leave the router. Let's take a look at each type of access list. Standard access lists. Standard access lists only specify the source and an IP address in the protocol suite. They cannot filter based on destination addresses or differences in individual ports and protocols. Normal standard access lists are designated with a number between 1 and 99. In addition, on modern routers, standard access lists can be designated with an expanded range between 1300 and 1999. Creating an access list with numbers in these ranges is what makes it a standard list. Here's the syntax for standard access lists. When I'm in user mode, I'll use enable to go to privilege mode. In privilege mode, I'll use config t to go to global configuration mode. There, I want to create an access list with the keyword access-list. I want to specify a number, in this case something between 1 and 99 to do a standard access list as opposed to extended. And then I want to select to either deny or permit traffic. I can specify a range of hosts or a single host with the keyword host. And then the IP address. Remember, it's the source IP, not the destination IP. Standard access lists only do source IPs, not destination IPs. So in this case, I'm going to deny any packet coming from the host 199.207.13.13. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is add my catch-all at the bottom. If I didn't, then no other traffic would go out of that interface because nothing else would match a rule. So I have to create a rule that matches all the other packets that don't come from 199.207.13.13. And those I choose to permit through that interface. So in this case, that last rule is my catch-all. Wildcard masks. 
You can use wildcards to specify entire subnets or networks with access lists. These wildcards must be based on a standard block value. Remember from our subnetting exercises in previous videos that those block values are 64, 32, 16, 8, and 4 when using our subnet formula 2 to the power of x minus 2, and a 4 byte 32 bit table structure for IP version 4. As with discontiguous VLSM, subnet ranges must start on a multiple of the block value. In addition, when you have chosen a block value, you must subtract 1 from it so that it will not overlap the next network available based on that chosen block value. Remember the block is the base multiple. In addition to wildcard masking on the block value minus 1, the masking for access lists is the inverse of a subnet mask. Recall that when subnetting 255, 255, 255, or a class C address, all 24 bits are used in the first three bytes of the mask for networking. Any two IP addresses must match those first three octets exactly to be in the same network. The zero in the last byte means that all the bytes' eight bits are for hosts, specifying a range between 1 and 254. This is not the case with wildcard masks on access lists. They are applied from an opposing perspective. Therefore, with wildcard masks, zero means that all eight bits of a byte must be matched exactly, and 255 specifies that the entire range of a byte's eight bits apply. Examples. One, to specify an entire class C network, we would do access list, the number, in this case for our standard list, one through 99, deny or permit, and then the source IP address, and then the mask. So in this case, we're saying the first three, since they're zeros, mean that the 199, the 207, and the 13, those three octets must be matched exactly. Now the last part, the 255, corresponds to the zero in the fourth octet, and that means any host on that network. They would all be denied uh, access. In the next example, example two, to specify any network, we could say access-list. Again, a number from one to 99 to specify a standard access list. Permit or deny, in this case permit, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 255, 255, 255, 255 means any network. The previous example above, that is number 2, is the same as specifying access dash list and then a number from 1 to 99 and permit any. Either would serve as a catch all rule. Let's look at some more wildcard block examples. An example of masking the first subnet of a 2 bit class C subnet would be access-list 7 deny 199-207-1364 64 being the block all right so that's the first network um, with a mask of 192 and using a block of 64 and then the masking part 000 that is to match the first two octets the network address 199-207-13 exactly and then the block minus 163 um, so that it's offset for the next network, which begins at 128. The second example is one of masking the first subnet of a 3-bit class B subnet. And again, the keywords are the same, access, dash, list, and then the number 7, deny. And for the class B, 1501 is matched by 00. zero. So the network address of the class B, CIDR 16, 16 bits, is matched exactly. And the third octet, we're on the first network if we use a block of you know a block value of 32. So we subtract one from it in the mask again to offset for the next network, which will turn around and begin at 64. And then the last octet 255 specifies that any host on that subnet. Uh, in the next example, here we have the first subnet of a 4-bit class A subnet. So again, the keywords are the same: access dash list seven deny, and then we have a zero to match the first octet exactly, right? It's class A, so eight bits, uh, CIDR eight. Then if you look at the next octet, we're choosing a block value of 16. And we subtract one from it to offset for the next network, which will begin at 32. So our mask value is gonna be 15. And then the last two octets, all those hosts belong in that subnet. So it's 255, 255. The next example, is that of masking the first of a 5-bit class C subnet. And again, the commands are access-list, 7-deny, and it's going to be 199-207-13, and 
notice that the mask part is 0, 0, 0, so we're matching those three octets, the 199, the 207, and the 13 exactly. And in the last octet, we're using a block of 8. Well, once again, we subtract 1, so our mask value is going to be 7. And that would take us up to the next network, which would begin you know, on a multiple of 8 at 16. The last example we have is that of the first subnet of a 6-bit class C subnet. And again, the command would be access dash list 7 deny 199207.13. Notice the mask part, the first direct that's 000. That means match the network address exactly. And then look at that last octet. The last octet of the IP address is 4. So the block is 4. Subtract 1, that's 3. And then that offsets us for the next network, which will begin on a multiple of 4 or 8. Let's take a look at applying access lists. Once they are created, access lists do nothing until they are applied to an interface for either outgoing or incoming traffic. To accomplish this, we use the access-group command. Examples. In the first example, I'm going to select an interface, the first serial port on a router, or s0 forward slash 0 forward slash 0. Then once I'm in interface configuration mode, I would use the command IP space access dash group the number of the access list, and I would specify either inbound or outbound with in or out, in this case in. In the next example, I'm selecting the gigabit Ethernet interface with G0 forward slash 0. Once I'm in interface configuration mode, I would apply a list previously created as 3 with the command IP access dash group 3 and out to specify outbound. Finally, in the last example, I'm selecting a fast Ethernet interface with 0 forward slash 0. I would then select a list I had previously created called 7 with the command IP access dash group 7 and in for inbound traffic. Let's take a look at applying access lists. Standard access lists may also be applied to line interfaces such as VTY for Telnet even though they cannot filter on a specific protocol or port like extended access lists. This is accomplished by using the access dash class command. In an example, we're in global configuration mode and we create an access list called 9 and it's to permit the address 109.207.13.13 to access a port. In this case, we want to specify Telnet, so it'll be for Telnet access. Next, we want to go into line configuration mode and specify the virtual terminal. We're on a 2900 series ISR router, so it would be line VTY0 1114. We get into line configuration mode, in this case for the virtual terminal, VTY for Telnet, and we can apply the list we previously created with the command access-class 9, and then in to specify inbound traffic. Again, the above command allows Telnet access from the specified source address of 199.207.13.13. Since there is no catch-all permit any rule defined afterwards, it implicitly denies all other source addresses from connecting via Telnet. So only 199.207.13.13 is going to be allowed to connect to this router via Telnet. Now we'll look at another basic type, extended access lists. Extended access lists can specify both a source and destination IP address. They can also distinguish between different individual protocols and ports. This gives an administrator much more control over traffic filtering than would be available through the use of standard access lists. Extended standard access lists are designated with a number between 100 and 199. In addition, on modern routers, extended access lists can be designated with an expanded range between 2000 and 2699. Creating an access list with numbers in these ranges is what makes it an extended list. Here's some examples of extended access lists. In our first example, we're going to deny a specific port and protocol to a specific host. So in global configuration mode, we'll create the list with the command access-list, and it needs to be a number between 100 and 199 to make it an extended list, so we chose 177. We're going to specify uh, both a source and destination, unlike a standard access list, which only does source. So we're going to deny, and we're also going to specify a protocol, TCP transmission control protocol. It's going to be any, and then host, a specific host, which will be 199.207.13.13. So any is the source and 
the host 192.7.13.13 is the destination. And then finally, we're going to select a specific port and protocol with EQ space 23, 23 being the port that is for Telnet. Okay, after that, we need to add the catch-all. So in the next line, in global configuration mode, again, we use the command access dash list 177 permit IP any being the source and any being the destination. So there's our catch-all. Now that we've created the access list, we need to apply it so it actually does something. So in global configuration mode, we're going to select an interface, in this case, fast ethernet, zero forge slash zero. And we're going to apply the access list with the command IP space access dash group, and then our number 177 and out to specify outbound traffic. Again, in the example above, any source IP is blocked from accessing the specific destination IP of 199.207.13.13 when the protocol is Telnet and the port is 23. Beneath the first rule, a second catch-all rule is defined that allows all other traffic that is not matched by the first rule. Here is another example of an extended access list. In this case, we're denying multiple ports and protocols to a specific host. So, we would create the list with access-list and some number between 100 and 199 and then deny and then the protocol so the action could be deny or permit the protocol transmission control protocol in this case then the source address which is anybody using the keyword any and then a specific destination address which is host and that address would be 199444 and now we're going to specify the port 21, which is the file transfer protocol or FTP. Then we're going to add another rule, and this time we're going to do the same thing, and we're going to choose to deny uh, Telnet access as well over port 23 from the same source and to the same destination. Finally, at the bottom, we would add our catch all, which will allow any other traffic that's not matching ports 21 and ports 23. Now we just need to apply it. So here we're going to select a gigabit. Uh, interface, in this case G0 forward slash 0. And we're going to use the command IP access dash group 101 out to specify outbound traffic. Once again, in the example above, for the first rule, any source IP is blocked from accessing the specific destination IP of 199.444 when the protocol is FTP and the port is 21. Beneath the first rule, a second rule blocks any source IP from accessing the specific destination IP of 199.444 when the protocol is Telnet and the port is 23. Finally, a third catch-all rule is defined that allows all other traffic that is not matched by the first and second rules. Here's a third example. In this example, we're going to use the log feature. To do this from global configuration mode, we'll make an access list called 106 with the command access-list 106. Since it's an extended access list and not a standard one, we can't just specify the source, we also have to give the destination. So we're going to choose an action, not permit, but this time deny, transmission control protocol, the protocol, and the source will be any, anybody out there. The destination will be the host 199.7.7.7. And now we're going to specify a port, in this case EQ23, the protocol being Telnet, and we're going to use the log option. And what this will do is log um, anytime the list matches traffic. Now we're going to add our catch-all with access-list 106 permit IP, the source being any, the destination being any, and now we need to apply it. We're going to select an interface, in this case uh, our second serial interface, so S0 forward slash 0 forward slash 1. And we're going to apply it with the command IP access-group 106 out. Once again, in the example above, any source IP is blocked from accessing the specific destination IP of 199.777 when the protocol is Telnet and the port is 23. Beneath the first rule, a second catch-all rule is defined that allows all other traffic that is not matched by the first rule. Also, we're using the log option, which will log a message each time the access list matches traffic. This may indicate inappropriate access and can be used as a security feature. In this fourth example, we're going to specify a range of addresses with a block wildcard mask. So, as we did previously, in global configuration mode, we'll use the command access-list, specify some number between 100 and 199, in this example 188. We'll choose an action, permit or deny, in this case deny. We'll choose a protocol, in this case TCP. 
we'll specify a source, in this case anybody, anyone with the keyword any. And now we're going to specify an entire range of destination addresses. In this case, we will match 150 and 4, the network part of a class B address exactly, since our mask is 00. zero. In the third octet, however, we're going to use a block value of 64, and the first network 64. So we'll subtract 1 for 63 for the mask, and then any host in that particular subnet will specify with the last mask value of 255. Finally, we're going to specify the port, port 21, for the protocol, file transfer protocol, or FTP. Then we add a second rule, and in this case we're doing the same thing, only now we're going to deny or block uh, telnet access via port 23. Finally, we're going to add our catch-all with access dash list 188 permit IP to specify and then any and then any for the source and the destination. Finally, we select an interface S00 forward slash one and then we're going to apply it with IP access dash group 188 and in this case we'll specify outgoing. Once again, in the example above, a range of hosts with any source IP and subnet 64 through 127 are blocked from passing through a selected interface when the protocol is FTP and the port is 21. Beneath the first rule, a second rule blocks a range of hosts with any source IP and subnets 128 to 191 from passing traffic when the protocol is Telnet and the port is 23. Finally, a third catch-all allows all other traffic that is not matched by the first two rules. And another key difference is, remember that the first rule is blocking FTP access for the first subnet, the 64 network. But notice that the next rule is blocking access for the second network, the 128 based subnet. Next we'll look at distribute access lists. Distribute lists are applied to protocols instead of interfaces. In this respect, they are very different from both standard and extended access lists. They are sometimes used to control whether or not a network is advertised from a particular interface when using dynamic routing protocols. When used in this way, distribute lists don't stop advertisements from being sent through an interface. They just control the content of those advertisements. Now let's look at named access lists. Named access lists are standard or extended access lists that can be referenced by an ASCII string label that you supply when you create them. They do not have to be referenced via a number like non-named access lists. In addition, when you create a named access list, the ISCLI prompt will change to config standard NACL or config EXT NACL, depending on whether it's a standard or an extended list that you're going to name, and remain there as you add rules to the list until you exit. This makes entering rules less cumbersome and much more convenient. In the first example, we're going to create and apply a standard named access list. When I'm in privilege mode, I use config t to go to global configuration mode. In global configuration mode, I use the command ip space access dash list, and instead of specifying a numerical range 1 through 99 for a standard or 100 through 199 for extended, I'll simply use the keyword either standard or extended. And then finally, I'll give it a string value, banana, uh, in this case block silence. And then once I've done that, notice the prompt will change. In this case, it'll go into either configure standard or extended. And since I chose standard, it's configure standard named access list. Much easier because I don't have to you know, keep typing the same IP access list you know, number, yada, yada, yada. It just changes the prompt and then I can just put my rules in. So it's like less work or less typing, at least in my opinion. So once I'm here at this prompt, I can specify deny well, it's standard, so it's only source. There is no destination with a standard list. So, in this case, I'm only going to deny something coming from the source of 199.207.13. And then the first network 64, a block of 64, I would subtract one of my mask value, so all the hosts on that subnet in that class C range, 000, matching the, um, in this case, the first three octets exactly, and then the last octet, all of the hosts on the 64 network. Finally, I'm going to add my catch-all, which would be permit any, and then I can exit out of the prompt, and then I would select the interface, just like I would with an extended or with a standard access list, and I can apply my named access list with IP, 
access-group, the name of the list that I previously created, in this case block silence, and out to specify outbound traffic. Once again, in the example above, a standard name access list is created with the name block silence. The prompt changes and the first rule denies all source IP addresses using Telnet and port 23 in the subnet range of 64 to 127 because 128 is the next network. The second rule is a catch-all and permits anything else. The prompt is exited and the named access list is then applied to an interface via its name. In this next example, we're creating and applying an extended named access list. Once again, from privilege mode, I'd use config t to go to global configuration mode. This time, I'll use a similar command, ip access list, but instead of specifying standard, I'll specify extended. And finally, I need to give it a string value, the name of the list, so we'll call it permit humans in this case. Notice the prompt will change. As it did with standard, so it will with extended. But in this case, it's config-ext-nacl for named access list. Now I can specify whether to permit or deny, in this case permit, the protocol transmission control protocol, or TCP, the source, which is anyone, and then the destination being the host 199-207-1313 exactly, and then the port 23, which would be the telnet protocol. Finally, I'm going to add my catch-all, which would be deny IP any any, so I permit this one address and anyone else is denied. I would exit. Notice the prompt goes back to global configuration mode. I'm going to select an interface, in this example, gigabit, so g0 forward slash 0, and I'll apply it with the command ip space access dash group, the name of the list, which would be permit humans, and then out to specify outbound traffic. Once again, in the example above, an extended named access list is created with the name permit humans. The prompt changes and the first rule permits all source IP addresses that are using Telnet and port 23. The second rule is a catch-all and denies anything else. The prompt is exited and the named access list is then applied to an interface via its name. Note, unlike standard and extended access lists, rules can be deleted on named access lists without deleting the entire list. With non-named access lists, your only choice is to delete the entire list or copy its contents to a text editor and paste your changes back through the command line interface as a new access list. In addition to router access lists, Cisco switches also allow special ACLs on their port interfaces that filter based on source and destination MAC addresses. They are called, of course, MAC access lists. Here's an example of a MAC access list configured on a switch called Pegasus. From privilege mode on the switch, we use config t to go to global configuration mode. In global configuration mode, we'll use the command MAC access list extended to create an extended MAC access list, and we'll give it a string value of rescue hybrids. Now we're going to, in this case, deny, and as a source, anyone, and then specify the host MAC of 444a.17fb.b444. Finally, we'll add a catch-all. So we'll do permit and source any destination any, and then we'll exit out of the prompt. Notice the prompt changed to config ext-macl for a MAC access list. And then when we exited, it went back to global configuration mode. Now we'll select an interface, in this case a port on the switch. So port four with interface f0 forward slash four. And finally, we'll apply the MAC access list with the command MAC space access dash group, and then the string name, which would be rescue hybrids, and we'll specify ingoing or outgoing, in this case, ingoing with the keyword in. Once again, in the example above, an extended MAC access list is created with the name rescue hybrids. The prompt changes, and the first rule denies any source MAC address from accessing the destination MAC address of 444a.17fb.b444. The second rule is a catch-all and permits anything else. The prompt is exited and the MAC access list is then applied to switch port 4 via its name. Time-based access lists. In addition to the four basic types of ACLs, the Cisco IS also supports time-based access lists. Example. Here's an example of a time-based access list. From privilege mode, we use config t to go to global configuration mode. 
First, we need to create two time ranges, one for the rule and one for the catch-all. So the first time range we'll create with the command time-range, and we'll give it a string value. Um, no spaces, so no underscore FTP. Now, we're going to select, once the prompt changes to config-time-range, the range. And we can choose weekdays or weekends, in this case, weekend. So periodic space weekend, and then it'll be from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Now we're going to exit that prompt, and since that was for our rule, now we need to create another time range for our catch-all. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to do, once again, time-range, and then a string value, no spaces, catch underscore all. And we're also going to select weekend once the prompt changes to config-time-range, and we'll specify from 5 to 9 a.m. Then we'll exit out. So we've created our two time ranges. Now we can create our access list, our time-based access list. So to do this, we'll create what appears to be a normal named access list. We'll use the command IP, access-list, extended, and then we'll give it the string value of weekend warriors. Once we do that, notice the prompt changes to config-ext-nacl for a named access list. And now we're going to specify that we're going to deny the traffic will be Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. The source will be any, e, and the destination will be any. E. And the port will be 21. Now we're going to give it the time range that we created previously. In this case, the no underscore FTP one. So in other words, from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., no FTP traffic will be allowed on that interface. Finally, we're going to apply the catch-all next. So we hit enter. On the prompt, once again, we say permit TCP source any, destination any, and then the second time range, time dash range, and catch underscore all, our catch all. Finally, we can exit out and select the interface, in this case, the serial interface, s0 forward slash 0 forward slash 0, and then use the command ip access dash group, the string name, weekend warriors that we gave our named access list, and we have to specify inbound or outbound traffic, in this case, n. One more time. Above, we create two time ranges and apply them to an extended access list. We then apply this extended access list to an interface to deny FTP traffic only between the hours of 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. on weekends. Finally, let's take a look at adding remarks to our access lists. Remarks are string values you can add to access lists to provide comments. This is useful where you may have dozens of access lists on a router, and you need to label what they are, what they do, and what they're applied to so you can kind of tell them apart. In this example, in privilege mode, we'll use config t to go to global configuration mode. We're going to create a normal extended access list. Remember that an extended access list is any number between 100 and 199. That's the range. So access-list 129 to create our extended list. We're going to use the keyword remark to specify a remark or comment to go at the top of our access list. And the string value we'll put in there is enter-battlestar space traffic space link. That'll just describe that access list. Okay, so on the next line, I'm gonna specify some normal rules. So we're gonna deny IP and then a specific host as the source, 199.207.13.13 to a destination or a range of destinations with the block 64 on network 64. Finally, the third rule we're gonna add is a, a catch-all. It's just gonna allow any traffic that is not previously matched by the first rule. And then once we do that, we can apply it by selecting the interface, in this case, serial 0 forward slash 0 forward slash 1, and you then use the command IP access dash group, and then the extended list number 129 and N to specify inbound traffic, and this would apply our access list. But this list now has a remark or a comment tag, and so we can look at that and we know, you know what it's for, what it's doing. Uh, once again, the extended access list above will now have a comment describing its use and purpose because we used the remark keyword. Finally, here are some commands for viewing access list configurations. We can use the command show access list to show all access lists, but not the interface they're applied to. We can use the command show access list and a number to specify a specific access list. We can use the command show IP access list to show configured IP access lists. We can use show IP interface to show interfaces and with their access list applied. We can use the command show MAC access dash group to show MAC access lists. And we can use the command show MAC access dash group and then specify a certain interface or a port on our switch 
to show a specific access list attached to that port. 